Hi, I'm Andy, and welcome to Real Garage. Let me tell you about my current project. It's a 1969 Pontiac Trans Am that I found in a barn in Virginia that hasn't seen the road since 1997. My vision for this car build will be a pro touring, borderline street legal, track ready beast with 700 horsepower. This will be a go car, not a show car. I like building cars that I'm not afraid to use. I like them to look good and be functional with some creature comfort, but on this car build, performance is gonna be the ultimate goal. I plan to regularly run this car on the street and take it to road course track days as well as some autocross events. So why this car? Well, the first Trans Am came out in 1969, and my first car was a 76 Trans Am when I was 15 and promptly blew the engine street racing. My father was not pleased and eventually made me sell the car before I could finish it. I've had many Trans Ams and Camaros since, but I really want to get into a first gen model. In this episode of Real Garage, we'll look at the rust areas that need to be addressed and what needs to be done now versus later in the build. And we'll have a real project. It took me and a friend about four days to strip this car from running and driving to ready to blast. Since this is gonna be a pro touring car, a lot of the stock parts won't be needed and will be sold to subsidize the build cost. After media blasting, the car appears to be in really good condition. Come with me and we're gonna take a look at the car and see some of the areas that we have concern with. First of all, the first thing I need to do really is address some of the floor pans. There's some perforation going on here. Not really bad. Uh, a lot of these I'll be able to just uh, drill and plug weld. And uh, some of the areas I will have to cut out and replace with a patch. But uh, uh, in this area, this is pretty typical on this type of car. You'll see some of the corners of the dash area by the window frame that will be rusted. This is actually a little bit of the rubber from the window that's still left after blasting. But up here in the corner, you'll see there's a considerable amount of rust in the corner where water has gathered between the window and the rubber seal. And that caused that to happen. This isn't bad doesn't mean that we're going to have to replace the roof which is really a pain in the butt but we'll cut this back and we'll replace this not immediately we'll do that before we're going to go out and have the body finished so i'll repair that later the areas i really want to address is going to be the stuff that i need to fix before i can put the front frame back together and put my frame connectors in here's another area that's very typical this is the blower area box the blower motor is mounted on the front and a lot of times leaves and debris get captured through the vent and it'll collect water in this area and this typically does rust out. This I will cut quite a large patch out because I will need to get to the inside. There is an area of the inside that's also got some rust on it and I'll be have to patch that as well. This area I'm not too concerned with really. I'm gonna be running some aftermarket air in this anyway, and quite possibly I'm gonna be running a bay bar to connect into the center roll cage from this area to connect to the front frame as a stiffener. So we also have some rust up in the other corner of the window, very light. That's gonna be a small patch. I've already fixed this one on the corner and that was pretty easy, so that's very typical on this type of car. On these areas here, you're gonna also wanna check the rockers. On this car, the rockers were exceptionally good condition. I was very surprised seeing as that was sitting in a barn. And a lot of times sitting in a barn, you get a lot of moisture from the bottom up. But as you can see on this car, the floor pans underneath are just exceptional. So if you're considering just drilling and plug welding some of those holes, make sure the bottom floor pans are still good because if the floor pans on the bottom are slightly rusted, the material that you're gonna be welding to is gonna be very thin. And I would just recommend going ahead and cutting the whole floor pan or just this piece out if that's the case. But this car actually had a dealer installed undercoating and that undercoating saved the bottom of this car. So this car already had the quarter panels replaced on it once before. Whoever did it before did a really good job. So I'm not really even gonna mess with replacing them again. So they've, 
They will have to do a little bit of seam, you know, just some seaming here. But at the same time, they did an exceptional job with the, with the quarter panels. And I'm really not going to mess with the quarter panels on that car at all. Okay. So as far as rust goes, we're looking pretty good. This back panel on the back window, habitually that thing is rusted too. That's not a very bad repair because that panel is available as an aftermarket replacement. So that could be replaced at any time. This one's in good shape. You'll notice that there's still some rubber left from the, from the window seal that's still on there, but uh, they do have a little bit of space on the corners. That'll have to repair. That's minor. And I'm probably gonna cut this whole rib out where the window sits and replace that too, because it does have some pitting on it. But uh, typically speaking, this area here I've seen on a lot of these cars is really rusted and gone. And people like to just put a bunch of Bondo in this area to fix it. But really that's not fixing the problem. You know, it's holding water for another reason. So that's like I say, when I come back to this part here, you know, somebody tried to fix it with some Bondo. That's not gonna help it at all. Yeah, it's just going to continue to rust behind it. So these areas really need to be cut out and re-welded to be properly fixed. So, so the areas that I'm going to do first are going to be the floor pans. I'm going to cut and drill some areas here and just re-plug weld them because the bottoms of the floor pans are still very solid. So I have plenty of metal to work with here. And there are a couple areas where I have too much perforation in. That area there, that piece there is going to be cut out and replaced. So, but outside of that, I think that's the areas that I'm going to address first on my rust repair. And that'll allow me to get to the point where I can put the front frame on and weld in my frame connector. Now would be a good time for a real scoop segment on rust repair. And remember, read and follow all labels and your owner's manual and use the proper safety gear. For rust repair where you have small perforations, I prefer the drill and plug weld method. I usually will use a Scotch-Brite pad on my angle grinder to clean up the top of the floor pan first. I can use the step drill to drill many different size holes. After I drill my hole, it usually leaves a burr underneath. I'll take my sanding disc and I will clean up that burr on the bottom. Then I will take my copper backing plate and I'll put it up underneath and I will plug weld it from the top side. For areas where you have a lot of perforations, it doesn't make sense to plug weld all those. We'll actually take the plasma cutter and we'll cut that area out and we'll take that piece we cut out and transfer that as a template on a new piece of metal and we'll cut it to fit and then we'll just weld that back in place. So I'm gonna take that piece that I cut out from the floor pan and I'm gonna just set it on here. I'm gonna cut out a little bit wider piece. I'm then gonna trace that piece on here and use my tin snips or a throatless shear to cut this to size. I'm gonna cut it a little bit strong because I'm gonna take my air grinder and I'm gonna sand it to the size that I exactly need. After you spot weld your patch all the way around, I like to take a light and shine it on both sides of my patch to make sure I don't have any spots where I can see light shining through, which would mean I missed a spot. After I do that, you can go back and metal finish to your liking. Let's check out one of my real projects to help optimize your garage space. It's time for another one of my DIY projects in my garage. My project today is to build myself a stand or a set of shelves to hold my jack stands. Jack stands are terrible because they take up a ton of floor space and you can't really stack them. So I'm trying to decide how to get rid of these things. So what I've come up with is I'm actually gonna build a vertical shelf, if you will, with four separate shelves for the jack stands. I decided to go vertical instead of horizontal because I wanna minimize the space that it takes up on my wall because I'm gonna try and put other things on there as well. So this way I can set them vertically and I'm not taking up a whole lot of footprint on my wall. So I'm gonna make my shelves nine and a half inches wide by seven and a half inches deep. Okay. 
I'm also going to make my shelves have a little gusset on the end that's going to be about seven inches tall too. So my approximate width of the shelf is going to be about nine and a half by about seven and a half inches there. So I said that my total height is going to be about 13 inches per jack stand. So that means my total height is going to be about 52 inches. I'm going to do the shelves first and bend both ends and then I'm going to measure the outside dimensions of the shelves and that's when I'm going to cut my actual size for the width of the back piece that they're going to be welded to. Now we have to talk about bend radiuses. So whenever you bend material, you're going to actually gain some length on that. So if I'm measuring seven and a half or nine and a half inches wide and I put two bends on it, it's actually going to end up wider than nine and a half inches. So you're going to have to calculate your bend radiuses. The 5052 aluminum is quite strong. If you find out that you're having a tough time bending the 5052 aluminum, you can anneal it. And that will remove some of the hardness and make it easier for you to bend. Okay, I've got my four shelves bent up. So if I measure these out from the back side to back side, I measured them out. The outside dimensions actually ends up about an eighth inch strong. So all these shelves turned out to be exactly the same. So I'm gonna cut that back piece just about nine and five eighths wide. So this is kind of my dry layout of what it's going to basically look like after I get done welding it together. There's plenty of ways you can cut this stuff. That's one of the reasons I love working with aluminum. The other reason I like it is it's light, it doesn't rust, so I don't have to paint it, and it actually looks good in its, in its raw form. So I'm going to take this over to the Multimatic 220 and TIG weld these together. But before I do so, I'm going to peel that protective film off of these pieces. Now, it looks really nice and clean in, underneath this protective film. The protective film really is only there to keep these things from getting scratched up. But you still have an oxide layer on the aluminum. So the best way to clean that off is going to be to wire brush it and then take some acetone and clean off that uh, oxide dust that you've just brushed off. For this project, I'm going to be using the Multimatic 220 ACDC. My material is that 5052 aluminum and it's 080 thick. So if I use my auto set, I can set it anywhere between that 14 gauge and the eighth inch setting and both of those will probably work fine. Because I'm gonna be doing some outside corner welds, I'm actually gonna take it off of auto set and I like to lower the frequency a little bit. The pro set for this machine or the standard default is 120 on the frequency but I'm gonna drop that down to about 100. And what that's gonna do for me is it's actually gonna widen the arc just a little bit when I'm working on those outside corner edges. That way I'm melting the full outside edge without having to put too much throttle in it to actually get the arc to widen out. So this way I'm letting the machine work for me on the width of that arc. I'm still gonna turn my amperage down to about that same thickness that I would be welding you know, roughly eighth inch material, and I'm gonna be managing that amperage with the foot pedal. When I'm not welding an outside corner, I'm gonna jump that frequency back up a little bit, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna concentrate the arc tighter when I'm doing a fillet weld or a T-joint. That's gonna make it easier for me to get down in that crack area of that fillet weld. So for those, I'm gonna jump it back up to 120 to 130. Anywhere around there is going to make it a little bit tighter. The machine maxes out at 150. So if you do need that arc to be even tighter yet, you could turn that frequency up. I've wire brushed and cleaned all the joints that I'm going to be welding. I also installed a gas lens on the end of my TIG torch. The gas lens is going to give me better gas coverage, especially on these outside corners. The outside corners are always falling away from the weld, so there's no way for the argon to get balled up on the weld joint to keep it shielded. So I like using a gas lens, and it gives me a much better gas coverage zone. I'm gonna try tacking these together without any filler metal first. Sometimes it's a challenge to get the base metal to fuse together, but I think it's gonna work well.
Now that I finished my jack stand storage project, I'm going to bring it over to the wall and mount it. I'm going to measure between the ribs on my steel siding and I'm going to drill two holes and use sheet metal screws to mount it to the wall. One thing I did have a challenge with though is when I was tacking the shelf in the middle, I found that it was trying to pull away from the back piece a little bit. So it would help if you had another pair of hands when you're tacking these shelves together in the middle of the back wall piece. If you had somebody or something to put weight on this shelf while you're tacking that to the back so it doesn't pull away or separate. Now that I've completed my jack stand storage shelves, I'm well on the way of getting better organized in my garage. On the next episode of Real Garage, we'll be installing the wheel tubs on this beast to give us room for those fat meats that we need to get that 700 horsepower to the ground. We'll also be doing a real scoop segment on the different methods of cutting metal and a real gear segment that compares the Multimatic 215 to the Multimatic 220 ACDC. So don't miss an episode of Real Garage.